As I continue to sew my way through the many vintage patterns I have in my collection, there has been one project that has been playing on my mind for a really long time. Ever since I first saw it, I knew that I wanted to make my own version of a 1950s swimsuit inspired by the marvellous Mrs. Maisel. Yes, that's right, that swimsuit. But also this one. I've had the fabric for a little while, but I've been holding off on making it to coincide with the Made Like Maisel challenge that is currently happening over on Instagram. I didn't want my swimsuit to be an exact replica of the Catskills one for a number of reasons, but mostly because I know it simply wouldn't suit me. The pink swimsuit from series 3 would be much better for my body shape, but pink really isn't my colour. So instead, I decided to give the outfit my own twist to better suit my skin tone and body type. I decided on a Mrs. Maisel but a Brighton Beach feel after I found this striped fabric that wasn't too pastel coloured. The pattern I am using is Simplicity 8139. It's a modern reprint of a vintage pattern, but I've seen lots of really successful versions online, and I also wanted to make the matching beach coat. Stay tuned for that video to follow shortly. I did my usual pattern adjustment, which is to take 3cm out of the lengthen and shorten line, and began cutting. I really struggled with cutting the jersey lining. I don't often make things out of jersey, and I can't use a rotary cutter for long periods of time without my arm going dead, so I just had to hack the pattern pieces out with scissors. I got there in the end, but there is definitely a reason I'm not showing you a close-up of this. I took great care to match the stripes for the main fabric. I knew I wouldn't be able to match them perfectly due to darts and such, but I really wanted my swimsuit to have the considered balance that Midges has. It's those little details that really help to make a garment look expensive, and I think it was definitely worth taking that extra time in cutting. With this being a fitted and lined garment, I knew that precision was going to be really important in creating a good fit and polished finish. So I used carbon paper and a tracing wheel to transfer all of the notches and balance marks, as well as mark on the sewing lines. I used yellow for the striped fashion fabric and blue for the jersey lining, although the blue ended up being more visible than I would like and for some reason is always more permanent than the other colours in the packet. As I knew I would need to fit the swimsuit to me as I sewed, I actually started by making up the lining. The first step was to make the bodice darts so that they were on the right side of the fabric. The jersey was a right pane to pin precisely, and so I ended up tacking the bodice darts in place using a ladder stitch. To do this, you leave the fabric flat on the table and sew a running stitch along the length of the dart but without pulling the thread taut. This leaves these long threads between stitches like the rungs of a ladder. Once you reach the end of the dart, you pull the thread tight and like magic, the dart is precisely tacked in place. To sew jersey on a regular sewing machine, it helps to use a ballpoint needle. These have a slightly rounded tip to them, which helps to prevent the threads of the jersey being cut as you sew. This is important, as if you get a hole in jersey, it starts to ladder, like a pair of tights. I also used the stretch stitch on my sewing machine to sew the darts in place. This is essentially a very narrow zigzag stitch, so if you don't have the option of a stretch stitch on your machine, you can always just change the settings and use a zigzag. The darts for the body of the lining were a lot easier to pin, or maybe I'd just gone a bit more practiced working with the jersey by then, but I matched the balance marks, pinned them in place, and then stitched those in place, again, using a stretch stitch. I don't think that this stretch stitch is prone to unravelling, but even so, I didn't reverse at the end of the dart, instead I left long tails of thread that I then knotted and trimmed off the excess thread. I was taught to always press jersey very gently and use lots of steam, especially if the jersey has a high elastane content. This meant I had to do quite a lot of work over a tailor's ham to get the darts to lie correctly. Next, I join the centre front bodice seam with wrong sides together. This pattern has the bodice lining sewn with wrong sides together, but the main body lining sewn with right sides together. This makes sense when you sew the lining to the main, but when making up the lining it can be a bit confusing, so if you make this pattern, make sure to double check your right and wrong sides. 
There is a little line of stitching around the centre front curve to reinforce what will be the opening for the bow tie. And then I join the main body pieces at the centre front. The next step was really tricky to do as it involved easing in the two curved edges of the bodice and the main body. Towards the centre front seam the angles get really tight and I found this really difficult to manage along with the stretch of the jersey. I matched the centre front seams and the balance marks and basically wrestled the two into each other before stitching in place with the stretch stitch. And then to finish up the lining, I join the centre back pieces below the marking for the bottom of the zip. Then I sew the side seams and the crotch seam. I was then ready for a fitting. I have to admit I was a little discouraged at this stage as I looked a lot less like Mrs Maisel and a lot more like Eugene Sandow. It was also much too big. I ended up making some pretty extensive alterations. So I thought that probably the easiest way to demonstrate the alterations I'm making for the fitting is with the paper pattern pieces. I need to bring in this centre front seam and this centre front seam here. So I've pinched out the amount I needed from my bodice piece but I, I can't just take it in at this centre front seam because of um, this crucial opening here which I don't quite understand yet but I'm sure will be made clear later but I know that this curve and this angle are important so I want to keep those the same so instead of altering this seam I've just pinched a little bit out further in and that will have the same effect it will just make the front ever so slightly narrower um, but on, uh, but on this uh, main sort of bodice piece, what I've had to do, actually, you can see I tried pinching it out, but then that was altering the angle of this curve too much. So instead, I've sort of just added it to the dart, the amount I needed to take out. So I haven't, I haven't added it evenly because I need the darts to still match up when I join them together. This dart and this dart need to match up. So um, yeah, I need to keep this line in the same place and add the excess on this side of the dart. I've also then, if you look at the other side, I pinched in quite a lot actually. This is two centimeters. Let me move that, that closer so you can see better. Uh, so on this side, I've pinched out two centimeters and then graded it out at the waist. And then simple, the, one, uh, the wonderful thing about tracing paper, this is the back piece, just flipped it over trace the line and that will be my new cutting line not sewing line for the back piece as well so that's what i've done now just to make it work i spent all of yesterday afternoon unpicking these darts and this part of the underbust seam which turned out with the zigzag lightning bolt stretch stitch was a real nightmare but uh, i've got it in the end i just cut this as i knew i was going to cut it down anyway so what I'm going to do is essentially redraw the line that I need here and again remark in where the darts need to go. Uh, make these alterations, stitch everything back up and then at the side seams I'm taking the excess evenly out of the front and the back piece so I'm just going to leave this stitching in, mark where my new stitching line needs to go and then sew it and then I'll chop this off later when I neaten my seams. Yeah I really want to avoid undoing these darts if I can as it's um, because they're a bit of a nightmare which means that I don't know how accurately I'm going to be able to mark in this line so there might be a little bit of making it up as I go along 
but I'm happy that this will then fit a lot better but it will mean that I have to completely make up the main fabric and fit that separately before I can stitch them together otherwise we're going to have some fit issues there I mean you never know let's see so I transferred all the new markings to the pattern pieces and stitched in all those alterations. Then once again to the ironing board and I gave everything a good press. I also clipped the underbus seam to help it to lie flat and to reduce some of the bulk around the centre front opening. I did a quick try on to check I was happy with my alterations before pressing up the hem by 1.5cm. The hems create a channel for elastic to run through to keep the bottom of the lining tight to the legs. The instructions called for the raw edge to be turned under, but I left mine as I knew I wanted to use my twin needle instead. At this point I also pressed under the remaining seam allowance of the centre back opening as this is hand stitched in place later. If you've never used a twin needle before they kind of create the same effect as a cover stitch with two parallel lines of straight stitching on the right side and a zigzag stitch underneath. You simply thread up the top part of your machine in the usual way but with two spools of thread. Make sure the threads don't get tangled around the shaft of the needle. This is one of those occasions where it is crucial to make a sample. You sew from the right side and position the raw edge of the hem in between the two needles so that the zigzag on the wrong side will cover the raw edge. I had to play with my machine's tension a lot to get this to work and even then it wasn't completely perfect. You can see how it's skipping a lot of stitches. I adjusted the tension on my bobbin case and had another go. But that just made things worse. I've taken out a lot of the footage here because honestly I spent half an hour fiddling with the tension. It was really boring but I did get to something halfway acceptable in the end. My issue was that the left hand needle was only going through a single layer of the jersey and so needed tighter tension than the right hand needle which was going through two. I could get one or the other to work perfectly, but not both at the same time. If this is something you know how to solve, please leave me a comment because honestly this drove me so mad that after I had sewn the hems I abandoned the lining and moved on to the main fabric bodice. The fashion fabric construction was almost exactly the same as the lining. First I sewed the bodice darts, tying off the threads in the usual way. Then I joined the centre front bodice seam. Unlike the lining, the main layer doesn't have a dart at the centre front, instead it gathers down to fit the lining. It is also reinforced around the area of the opening, just like the lining. But the main body of the swimsuit is shaped with panels, not darts. The first step was to stay stitch the curved top edge of each panel. Then, the panels were joined together, starting with the centre front seam. I pinned the panels really carefully so that the stripes matched exactly. That way I would get a chevron effect once the seams were pressed flat. I made it the front piece first so that I could tackle that tricky underbust seam. But first I had to press all the darts and seams I had just sewn. To get the seam allowances to lie flat I had to snip them. I did this automatically, forgetting that I still had to fit the main fabric layer and I may need to let it out. Although I didn't panic too much as I was pretty confident it was going to be too big rather than too small. To ease in the underbus seam, the instructions said to notch the seam allowance, but this didn't make much of a difference to my ability to get the two to sit nicely. This time around I also had the added headache of trying to match the stripes, which was actually pretty easy thanks to the care I had taken earlier when cutting. I finally was able to run this seam through a sewing machine, but I really wasn't happy with the way the final seam was fitting.
All that remained was the side seams, which again I pinned carefully to make sure the stripes matched before sewing them together. The finished look of the outer dress layer was much more what I had been hoping for, although I had similar fit issues to the lining, and I wasn't entirely happy with the placement of the stripes. You can see how that curved centre front bodice seam has created a sort of target right in the middle of my chest. And that wide dark blue stripe down the centre front isn't very flattering. I played around with the fit until I felt like the cute stick of Brighton Rock I had envisioned before making all the adjustments. So post fitting what I'm going to do is I'm going to greatly take in the centre front seam across the bust and also I'm going to straighten it up because um, this curved seam I am um, I don't understand why anyone would deliberately want their boobs to look really pouchy but that's what this dress does on me so I'm getting rid of that. I'm going to straighten that line up. I'm also taking in this centre front seam here. This is going to play with this opening for the bow here but I'm just going to wing it anyway because I'm not going to do this weird construction here, I'm trying to flip it. I'm also taking in this seam mostly because the look of that wide blue stripe I don't like. I'm also going to take in, I'm going to leave, oh, oh wait, you can't see that. I'm going to leave the side front panel the same width but move over the seam placement so that this panel is a little bit narrower down to the waist. I'm going to pinch it out like that. So let's get started with those. I knew that for the bodice centre front that I was going to follow the line of the stripes, so I just did a quick measure to transfer that new line onto my pattern piece, just in case I ever make this pattern again. I also marked on the alterations to the front bodice panel at the centre front and side front seams. Then I made a cup of tea to accompany my unpicking of all those seams. Then I chalked on my new sewing lines. For the centre front seam, I only marked up one side of the fabric as I was taking the excess out evenly. For the side front seam, to make sure my panels were altered evenly, I marked up one side, then matched up the two panels and used a tracing wheel to transfer my new line exactly to the other panel. I then went over that line with chalk so that I could see it a bit better. Then I matched up my new sewing lines and reconstructed my front piece. I took everything back to the ironing board for a thorough press. I mentioned earlier that I wasn't going to do the suggested construction method of easing the underbust seam in right sides together. Instead, I used the same method as for my 1950s vintage slip, pressing under the seam allowance along the curved top edge of the skirt section and then overlapping the bottom of the bodice so that the seam allowance is matched. This was much, much easier and it meant that I could be even more accurate when matching my stripes. I then top stitched the skirt section in place using my top stitching foot. I usually don't like to have visible top stitching on my garments, but frankly, I would rather that than a dodgy underbust. Next, I joined the front piece to the back at the side seams. Then, I put the zip into the centre back seam. 
Thankfully, this pattern didn't call for an invisible zip, so instead I used a vintage metal dress zip from my vintage haberdashery stash. I tacked shut the section of the seam where the zip will be, then centered the zip over the seam and tacked it in place by hand. I have considered that a metal zip may not be the best choice for a swimsuit as it may rust, but many of the surviving 50 swimsuits I've seen had metal zips, so I'm calling this historically accurate. Once tacked in place, I use a zipper foot to stitch the zip in place. I start below the zip pull and stitch as close to the zip teeth as I can. Once I get to the bottom, I change sides and repeat. But this time when I get to the bottom of the zip, I pivot and sew over the bottom of the zip to reinforce the area. I then take out the tacking and open up the zip so that I can go back and finish off the top parts that I missed due to the bulk of the zip pull. I decided at this moment to use pinking shears to neaten all the seam allowances to stop them fraying. Then it was time for a hem. I really liked the length of the swimsuit as it was and so I ended up doing something that I don't often do on my makes and that is a machine rolled hem. I generally dread doing them but having done it on this make I'm not really sure why as it was much easier than I expected. I literally haven't done one in about 10 years though so it might just be I'm a better machinist now. This pretty much completed the outer dress part and so I had to return to the lining which I had abandoned in frustration earlier. I measured out the elastic that I needed to insert into the leg cuffs by measuring around my upper thigh and then cutting two lengths of elastic. Then, using a safety pin, I threaded it through an opening in the cuff to gather up the hem. Once it came back out the other side, I machined the two ends of the elastic together with a zigzag stitch. To keep the elastic from twisting, I then did a stitch in the ditch through the side seams and the inside leg. It was then finally time to attach the lining to the main fabric. I patiently pinned the two together, trying my best not to stretch out the lining and keep everything flat. As I had altered the lining to be smaller than the main, I had to do a little bit of easing it in. This was a nightmare to then stitch together. The nature of the two fabrics fought each other badly and it took all my concentration and effort to get it through the machine. So much so that this is the only footage I captured of this particular step as I completely forgot that you might actually want to see what I was doing and not just the back of my head. Eventually, I got the two layers stitched together and could start clipping the curves around the armhole and into the corners of the neckline. I really took my time in pressing the lining around to the inside as it was incredibly springy and took some persuading to lie flat. A tailor's clapper would have been really useful here to let the seams set in place as they cooled, but I don't own one. I use my hands as I have very little sensation in them, but generally that's a bad idea so don't be like me. I also had the idea to turn my sleeve board over and use that as a clapper, which worked surprisingly well, so try that instead. The instructions had called for the lining to be understitched, but as my jersey was so springy, and because I had already top stitched one seam, I thought, hey, what's a bit more top stitching? And top stitched the top edge instead. Finally, I joined the shoulder seams of the main fabric, leaving the lining to be finished by hand. And with that, all the machine sewing was done. Only, not quite. 
I had forgotten about the decorative bow tie at the front, which I made by pinning the two pieces right sides together and stitching around the outside edge with a one centimeter seam allowance. I left a small opening so that I could turn the bow right sides out and then I top stitched around the edge of the bow to close up the opening and create a crisp edge. Then it really was only the hand finishing remaining. I took up position to enjoy the last of the evening sunlight, only I forgot my thimble, so I had to rush back inside to get it. The first thing to do was to fold under the seam allowance of the lining at the centre back and slip stitch it in place along the edge of the zip, enclosing all the raw edges. Then I had to turn under the lining seam allowance at the shoulder seams and slip stitch the front and back together. At this point my camera battery died and the sun was beginning to set so I left the final touches to the morning. I pinned in place the opening at the underbust for the bow so that all the seam allowances were enclosed. Amazingly, even though I really kind of bodged some alterations at the centre front seam, the opening still worked with only a very little negotiation. I slip stitched the lining to the main and then gathered up the centre front seam of the main bodice layer by hand. I was supposed to do this by machine earlier, but I forgot. The very last thing to do was to install the bow and tie it in place. I faffed around with this for longer than I care to admit to get it sitting nicely. But then the swimsuit was complete. Then I took some time out and watched a certain Karolina Zabrowska video and then this happened. I then tried my best to recreate some of the iconic swimsuit moments from the series with mixed results. I very briefly contemplated commandeering a boat to take better pictures but decided that was probably a step too far. Joking aside, I am really pleased with how my Made Like Maisel swimsuit turned out. I may not have a career as a pin-up girl ahead of me but my new swimsuit makes me feel really cute. The lining is fighting the fashion fabric quite a lot at the back, but I'm not really that bothered as I can't see that when I wear it. I'm also not sure how I feel about the gathered baby romper style shorts of the lining. I guess it's necessary if you were going to wear the swimsuit for actual swimming, just not poncing around the garden pretending to be Mrs. Maisel like me. But all in all, I think I was able to achieve that Mrs. Maisel at Brighton Beach look that I was going for. This was a really fun little project. I've never made something like this before, as in, I guess, a cosplay, something based on a screen character, but I really enjoyed it. If you'd like to see more Made Like Maisel looks, I really recommend checking out the Made Like Maisel hashtag over on Instagram. Thanks for watching, see you next time.